الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين يوفون بأهد الله ولا ينقضون الميثاق والذين يسلون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويخشون ربهم ويخافون سوء العذاب صدق الله العظيم Alhamdulillah, all praises are for Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, who has blessed us with many of his favors and blessings, which we continue to enjoy on the face of the earth. We should continue to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings every single day in our lives. Last week we had started a discussion on some of the Beautiful, beautiful verses of the Holy Quran. And a very powerful message Allah has sent in the very first, first verse that was quoted was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divided people into two categories. Those who have sight and they can see and those who are blind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says from among the two groups of people, those who have sight and they can see, they are indeed the intelligent ones. As for those who are blind, they are not intelligent. So this is why after dividing both, that one category of people are those who have sight, they can see. And another category of people are those who are blind. Allah says, are those who can see equal to those who are blind they cannot be equal they cannot be equal he in that same ayah Allah mentions who are those who are the people that are known to be having sight those people who can see those people who are intelligent in his sight who are those people he says they are those people who believe in the truth because the ayah was being revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says they are those people who believe in the truth of what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad. Those are the people with sight. The Quran was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited the verses and invited the people to believe in the Quran and invited the people to listen to the Quran. This is why one of the tasks of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from among the four different jobs that he was given by Allah is that he must recite the book to them and teach them the book. Teach them what Allah wants from them. Teach them the Quran and explain it. So he recited the Quran to every single person. Those who were in front of him. Family members, friends, people from different tribes. All the people used to hear the recitation of the Quran. They were people who were Arabs. So they understand, understood immediately the language. They understood immediately what the Quran was telling them. What Allah was saying to them. They understood that immediately. There was no need for them to study the Arabic language. They were Arabs. Arabic was their first language. That was their mother tongue. So the Quran was revealed they immediately understood it. So they knew exactly what the Quran was saying to them. But from among all those people, hundreds and then thousands of people, there were those people who turned to it and said, yes, we believe this is the truth. We believe this is the truth. And there were those who turned to the prophet and said, we don't believe in what you are saying. What you are saying, they are fairy tales of the past. They are made up things by yourself. 
This, these are your words. You have gone by other people and made up these words. This is poetry you are reciting to us. So, from then until now, people continue to be in two different categories. Those who accepted and said, yes, we believe that the Quran is the truth. We believe it is the haqq from Allah and have taken to practice upon it. And there are those who say, no, we don't believe in it. We don't accept it. We are not going to practice on it. Allah says, those who accepted it and they believed in it and those who will believe in it, they are people with sight. They are basir. They have sight. Those people who rejected it, they are people who are blind. And those people who have sight and they have accepted the Quran and taken the Quran to practice upon it, Allah says, Innama yatadhakkaru ulul albab. It is only such people who are intelligent. These are the people alone who will take it as a reminder. No one besides them. People who are not intelligent. Intelligence in a man tells him to look at things, to not only look for what he has in front of him today, but intelligence in a man tells him, look forward for tomorrow, what will happen? So we don't live today for the day today, but we live for our future life in the hereafter. We have everything today. We are enjoying life today. We have all the facilities in our lives. We have all the comforts in our lives. What's going to happen tomorrow? Will we have that? Would we be comfortable? What about when we are thrown in the grave or placed in the grave and we are made to rest there beneath six feet covered with dirt? How will it be for us? What will be life like over there? The intelligent man is the man who looks ahead. And it is in this context the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he mentions and he says, Al Kayisu Mandana Nafsahu wa amila lima ba'd al maut. Wala ajizu mani taba ahawa watamanna ala Allah. The intelligent man and the wise man is the man who takes a stock of his, himself. He checks himself. He checks what he does. He checks his actions. He checks his day to day life. His morning and his evening. Oh, how? How does the man pass these times? What does he do? What does he say? He checks himself. He keeps an eye on his own self before putting an eye on anybody else. Before pinpointing the faults of other people, he pinpoints his own, his own faults. Before trying to correct other people, he corrects his own self. He reforms himself. Because he knows very well that tomorrow when he stands in front of Allah, Allah will not ask him about what Zaid did and what Bakr did and what Siddiq did. Allah will ask him about what you did as an individual. He is intelligent. He knows there is a day that is called the day of accounting. So, and this life is given to prepare for that day of accounting. So he does not. Busy himself in matters that does not concern him. He does not busy himself with such matters that are perishable. That's going to leave him one day. But he busies himself with such things that will remain with him forever and ever in this life and the life hereafter. So this is why when people behave in this manner, Allah calls them intelligent people but because they are really intelligent. Because an intelligent man is not a man who heaps up everything for today and he doesn't know he's not concerned about tomorrow. And he says to himself, when tomorrow come, I will see about tomorrow. And he says to himself, let me live a good life, enjoy the best of it. When I die, I will see what will go on. You wouldn't be able to see what will go on because the afterlife is based on the life that is lived on the face of the earth. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the only people who will really benefit from the Quran, who will take from the Quran and practice upon the Quran, 
they are those people about whom Allah says, "Inna yatadhakkaru ulul albab." Only the intelligent people, people with reasoning, people with aqal, they alone will take the reminder of the Holy Quran. Then we also mention, and we want the topic of what are the signs of intelligent people. What are the signs of Ulul Al-Bab? And that is the format of, format of the Qur'an. And that is the beautiful way of the Holy Qur'an. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning, Allah spoke about the Qur'an, Alif Lameen, Thalika Al-Kitabu La Rayba Fi, Hudallil Mutaqeen. Allah says, this is a Qur'an, there is no doubt in it. This is a guidance for the Mutaqeen. And we know mutaqi means righteous people. Then immediately Allah begins to give the attributes of the mutaqin one after the other. So that we will recognize who are the mutaqin. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions any word in the Quran about people, if he mentions about those people who have hypocrisy, he goes on to highlight one after the other. What are the signs of those people who have hypocrisy? When Allah mentions about the fujar and the transgressors and the sinners, and the disobedient ones, Allah pinpoints now what are the attributes and the traits of those people. So after Allah mentions, after, after mentioning that those people alone will benefit from the Quran and take its reminder and practice upon it as being intelligent, then Allah highlights who are the intelligent people. Is it sufficient for a man to say, well, I am intelligent or he is intelligent or she is intelligent? Allah says, you will use what I have mentioned here as a yardstick to gauge whether you are intelligent or not. Quality starts. First quality, the first attribute of an intelligent man who takes the Quran as his guide, subhanallah, and he has sight, is that the promises that he has made, the agreement and the covenant that he has entered into with Allah, he does not break that at all. That's the first sign. That's a first sign. In other words, everything stems from keeping that covenant. Everything stems from that. And we, we all can understand how important it is. And it is the foundation of recognizing goodness. A man borrows money from you. Let's look at that example. He borrows money from you. He enters into an agreement. And he says, at the end of this month, I will pay you back all the monies that I have borrowed. I'm taking it to invest. He has probably borrowed about $20,000. So then, at the end of February, he entered into an agreement. Isn't that so? This, and by entering into an agreement, he has actually made a promise to you. I promise I will be, pay you this amount. This is a pledge I am making I will promise. And you, based on the promise, you have given it to him because you are thinking, my Muslim brother will not go against his word. Then at the end of the month, he has the money. But he does not pay you. But what he does, he walks throughout the village and he looks for every poor man, those who can accept zakat and sadaqah, and he is given out all these monies. Do you think he's a good man? No. Why? Because the agreement he entered to, he has broken that agreement. So Allah will no, not look at all those different charities you are given. Allah will look to see, are you fulfilling the agreement you have made with another person? That promise that you have made, are you keeping your promise? Are you fulfilling your promise? That is very, very important. It's just like a man Salah is five times compulsory per day. He performs none of the five times salat, which actually is a covenant that he has made with Allah to do that. But he's engaged in a lot of nafil salat and getting up every morning for tahajjud. He gets up and he performs a hundred rakats of tahajjud salat. But when fajr enters, he goes to sleep. Subhanallah. The first and foremost thing, this is why this is the first attribute of a man who takes, on, takes to the Quran. Fulfill the promise you have made. It. That agreement you have entered into with Allah, you must fulfill that agreement. 
that covenant. And that is, as I was mentioning also after speaking about a few other things, that the kalima you and I recite as Muslims and others have recited who have accepted Islam and they have recited it to enter into Islam, to accept Islam. All of us, we normally recite the kalima. By uttering that kalima, we enter into a pledge. We enter into an agreement with Allah, whereby we actually make a promise to Allah that, O oh Allah, I have taken you, you alone as my Lord. Thus, I will worship you. I will obey you. What you have ordered me to do, I will do it. And what you have prohibited me from doing, I will stay away from it. That is a, a promise we have made to Allah. That is a covenant we have entered into. So as Muslims now, we recited the kalima, we are Muslims, it is our duty every single day in our lives to fulfill the terms of the agreement. That is our duty. To fulfill the terms of the agreement. And while it is about doing what Allah has ordered us to do on a daily basis, whether it is connected to good treatment to our family members, obedience to our parents, it is about performing salat, or giving zakat, or going for hajj, or observing the fast, or, or dealing good with people. While it is so, it is also about not doing what Allah has made haram. So whatever Allah has made haram and unlawful for all of us as Muslims, staying away from that is fulfilling the agreement we have entered into. So we must not think that we are on our own. And if we do, we do. And if we do not do, we do not do. Every single thing we do will tell Allah whether we are true in our words to fulfill the terms of the agreement or not. And my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, we know that this is a season where there, there are a lot of wrongdoings and sinful actions and activities that surround us. The worst of them all, and it will become worse because things are not getting better in any field. So what we are witnessing here, they are all haram, unlawful, sinful activities. Subhanallah. You know at the time of Lut alayhi salam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought about a punishment to the people of Lut alayhi salam, for bringing about homosexuality and this sort of attitude, Allah mentioned in the Quran that you people have brought such an action on the face of the earth, one action that nobody else in the history of man has ever brought such an action on the face of the earth. Now you tell me from the time of Lut until now, this is more or less what we have around us. It's much more. In fact, they have made the people of Lut look small. They have made them the people what they have actually invented from among wrongdoings. They have actually made the actions of the people of Lut insignificant. They have made it look like it's not valuable. But it is telling us that if Allah destroyed five big cities... For that one action, what will Allah do to people today who are involved in much, much more than that? So the world is filled with heinous sins, with wickedness, evil deeds. And we must know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made all these things haram for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran says, Yanha an al fahshai wal munkari wal bagh. Allah has totally prohibited all actions, all indecent actions, immoral actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited all wrong deeds, all actions of that nature. Allah has prohibited believers from doing it. Allah has prohibited believers from being a part of it from supporting it, from looking at it, from hearing it, all those things are totally prohibited. This is why in Surah Furqan, when Allah highlights what believers do not do, 
That is sad. That's a sign of a believer. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورِ The believers, the true believers are those people who do not witness falsehood at all. Subhanallah. That's the quality of a believer. That the trait, the outstanding trait of a believer is that he does not witness falsehood at all. Anything that is wrong, anything that is haram, he does not look at it, one, that's witnessing. He does not hear it, that's the other. He does not be there. He does not support it. But what had he, he does, he goes against it, he speaks against it, and he keeps himself away from it and his family members and those who are under his hands where he has made the guardian over those people by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'yatihi. Each and every one of you, you are a guardian. And on the day of judgment, Allah will question you about those people who were under your hands. A man is a guardian over his wife, he will be questioned about his wife. A man is a guardian over his wife and children, he will be questioned about them. In the absence of the husband, when he goes out to work, and the mother is with her kids, she is now the guardian over them. She is accountable to Allah for what they do and what they do not do now. So therefore, Allah says uh, that believers are such people, la yashhaduna zur, they do not witness evil and wicked actions and haram and sinful actions. Wa idha marru billaghwi and any time they pass uh, by those things that are evil, those things that are unlawful, those things that are haram, anytime they pass because of where you may have to go, some activity might be taking place, you know. And you are passing by that, subhanallah, what does Allah say? Marru kirama, they pass by it with dignity, they do not fall into haram. They leave everything aside and they remember their duties towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is an outstanding trait of the believer which Allah has mentioned. And ayats like these are a very good, are very good reminders for us, especially in a season where every direction you turn to, subhanAllah, it is filled with evil and haram. It is filled with haram. Probably this is one of the reasons that people who are not even Muslims they get out of a society that is filled with so much wrongs. They get out of this place. They go away. They go for holidays. They go to a quiet and peaceful place that do not have these things. For that reason, how much more we should recognize the serious need here of the unlawfulness and the prohibition and the dirtiness of such actions. So, the believer is one who fulfills, subhanallah, the orders of Allah. Immediately after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يَسِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُسَلَى And the believers, those with sight, those who are intelligent, are those people who maintain the relations which Allah has ordered them to maintain. Subhanallah. That's a beautiful, a beautiful ayah. That the believers are people who maintain the relations which Allah has ordered them to maintain. A believer must have this. And relations are on three levels that we must understand. Just before these ayats, these are verses 25 and 26 of Surah Ra'd, but just before that, 23 and 24, Allah highlighted the traits of the hypocrites. And what was a trait of the hypocrites? One is that they do not fulfill the agreement they have made with Allah. The trait of the believer is the opposite. Allah brought it in 25. Subhanallah. What's the other trait? Though they are those who وَيَقْتَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلَى They break the relations which Allah has ordered to make. Allah says that's their attribute. But you as believers, what is your attribute? You build, you maintain what Allah has ordered you to maintain. Two opposites. 
And under that relations, as I said, there are three levels. The first relation that we have to maintain, the first relationship that is forced to be maintained is our relationship with Allah. We could never and we can not break that relationship. Our relationship with Allah is that Allah is the creator, we are the created beings. Allah is the khaliq, we are the makhluk. Allah is the master, we are slaves. We are the beings who have been created. Allah is the nourisher, we are the nourished ones. Allah is the provider, we are provided for. Allah takes care of all our needs. Allah takes care of whatever we need, subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the relationship is that since Allah has created us, has given us everything on the face of the earth, it is our duty now to repay Allah by being obedient to Him. Anytime we stop that, and we, we begin to disobey Allah, and we stop worshipping Allah, and we stop doing what Allah has ordered us to do, we are breaking our relationship with Allah. We are severing ties with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anytime we begin to behave in a manner that we say, Oh Allah, I don't want to listen to you again. Don't you see when we behave like that with our parents, what our parents say? You have severed ties from me. If you tell your mother and father, I don't want to listen to you again. I don't want, I'm not going to listen to you. Isn't that breaking ties? Yes. So when our behavior says to Allah, we don't want to listen to you again. This obedience thing, it's too hard for me. We are breaking relations with Allah. And when we break relations with Allah, then what type of future do we expect to have in this world and the hereafter? When Allah is the sole provider and nourisher, Allah is the one who takes care of us and all our needs. The second level of relationship is the relationship which we have with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he is our Nabi, we are his followers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen prophets at different times to send them on the face of the earth. That they will be guides for people. Because this journey of life is a very long journey. A very, very long journey. If Allah has given you a lifespan of 60 years, from day one you have to live for 60 years, the road is very long. The road can become confusing and puzzling at times. In the road of life, you will reach a junction where there are four roads or three roads in front of you. You don't know which road to take. You are passing on the straight road and you see a branch road, you don't know which one to take. On the road of life, there are many obstacles and hurdles. There are many temptations that will come to you and come to myself. There are many things the Prophet ﷺ said, On these streets, there are devils and satans waiting there, inviting you and calling you to tread that road and to go into that road. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the anbiyas to be our guides on the road, to show us how to walk the journey of life. And walk on the road of life. Which road to take? The right side or the left side? Where to go? What to do? The ambiance guided us. They came and they lived among the people. And every single action they had shown what the human being should do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to us. Our guide as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By reciting Muhammad Rasulullah. We have entered into an agreement saying to Allah. We accept him as our guide and we will follow him. The Prophet ﷺ came on the face of the earth and he has shown us the way to live life that Allah has given to us. He is our guide. We're supposed to be his followers. If he has shown us to walk on a certain path and he says to us, when you reach at this junction, Take the road on the right side. But when we reach that junction, we took the road on the left side. What do you think would happen to us? Subhanallah. This is why, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, do you know why Muslims are suffering so much? Because we are failing to fulfill that covenant we have made to Allah. And when the Rasul has been sent to as our guide, 
we are taking other people as our guide. We are taking our desires as our guide. We are taking other human beings as our guide. We are taking our intelligence and our reason as our guide. And we are failing to take the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as our guide. In other words, what we are actually doing is to say Allah, to Allah, I am a Muslim. But to be a full-fledged follower, it's a bit difficult. I can't be a full-fledged follower. I will follow, you see Salah to Allah? Yeah, I'll do it how the Prophet showed me. When I go for Hajj for five days, I will do it exactly how the Prophet showed me to do it. When I have to fast, whatever the Prophet told me, I will do it. How much in zakat? What I must give zakat? Yes, I will be a full-fledged follower. But you see the other things about how I live my life on a daily basis and what I do when I'm with my family at home and when I want leisure time and pleasure time and I want something for entertainment and I want to go here for vacation and enjoy myself. That's kind of difficult. So we are failing to be followers. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the secret of our success in total obedience to him, and in full following of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then it means that if we are to be successful, and we are to be an upright people, living with honor, with prestige, with respect in the eyes of other human beings, it can only come through these, these different ways. Anytime we brush that aside, and we forget our way, we forget our road, we forget who is our guide. We forget who we have to follow. We forget what we have to do. Then, my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, we will be humiliated on the face of the earth. Remember an incident. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and after they conquered Jerusalem, first time in the history, they conquered Jerusalem. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and they won Philistine, Jerusalem, without any violence, without any war. The Muslims lived such a beautiful life, the Sahabas and the Tabi'in. Why? Because everything they did, they ensured that they were doing it in accordance to the teachings that were given to them. Every single thing they did. They ensured that they did, did it right. So therefore, what do you expect will come in return? The blessings from Allah. Allah honored them. Allah blessed them. Allah provided for them. Allah made them wealthy after they were poor. Allah gave them honor after they were humiliated by others. The people, the, the Christians in whose hands was the authority of ruling Masjid al-Aqsa and Jerusalem. They lived aside, alongside with the Jews. Because Masjid al-Aqsa, it is a holy place for these three great religions. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. The Christians, when they saw the great type of leadership and rule coming from the Muslims, when Omar radiallahu ta'ala was there, they wrote a letter to Omar telling Omar, O commander of the faithful Come to Jerusalem, we will hand over full authority to you over Jerusalem. Subhanallah. We pray for you above the Jews. That's what they said. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and left. And he had his khadim, his personal attendant with him. And while they were riding and they entered into Jerusalem, they handed them the keys to Masjid al-Aqsa. Subhanallah, from that day on, Masjid al-Aqsa remained in the hands of the Muslims until problems started to come up. Always remained there. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala entered the city, he placed the, his attendant on the mount. He held the reins of the horse. He was walking on his foot. And his attendant, Qadim, was on the horse. Onlookers will think the one on the horse is the commander of the faithful. He's Umar. And they would think that the one on the ground 
is the attendant, the khadim, the one who's making khidmat and service. He's holding and he's walking like that. So the khadim and attendant now, he's upset. He says, oh, Amirul Mu'minin, you supposed to be here, not there. I supposed to be on the ground. You supposed to be on this position, an elevated and honored position. So people will know you are the Amirul Mu'minin. People will know you are the commander of the faithful. He started in that way. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and says, he says, beware of what you are saying. He says, listen carefully to my words. Allah gave us and granted us honor through deen, the deen of Islam. Allah didn't give us honor through the world and worldly possessions and worldly names. Anytime the Muslim starts to seek honor and respect through the worldly possessions, Allah will humiliate them. When you seek honor from Allah through Islam and through deen, Allah will honor you. He says, Allah honored us through our deen. Islam came. We accepted Islam. We obeyed Allah. We followed our messenger. Allah gave us lofty position. So Allah honored us. But anytime our gaze moves away from our deen and goes to the dunya and the world, and we seek honor, prestige, respect, and name through the world now, Allah will humiliate us. And that is exactly what happened as Umar radiallahu ta'ala said. When the Muslims were given an abundance of wealth and they started to seek prestige and honor and respect through this, Allah humiliated them and they continue to be humiliated until today. And Allah has shown us at that time when the Muslims were extremely poor, the Sahabas had no clothing to clothe their body. They had no food to eat. For days they will go without food. They will dip the green leaves in water to eat, to pass the day. Nothing whatsoever. Allah honored them, subhanAllah, that the mighty empires in those days came at their feet, subhanAllah. And they ruled for centuries. Wealth started to flow, but they were honest. They were devoted. They were good Muslims, practicing Muslims, and it remained in their hands as long as they lived on the face of the earth. But as soon as the Tabu'at Tabi'in passed away, the third generation and the love for wealth and the love for name and the love for possession started to enter into the hearts of the Muslims, then Allah took away that honor and he started to suffer them with humiliation. And one after the other, all the places that were conquered and ruled by the Muslims were stolen, were taken away, and they were thrown back on their heels. And we continue to suffer that until today. And so many years have passed, probably 1,000 years, and we still, still the Ummah of Rasulullah seem that they cannot rise back on their feet to that honor, prestige, and respect which Allah had given them in the beginning. Because the tawajju, the attention has changed. It has gone away from Allah. It has gone to other things. So now my dear beloved brothers and my dear sisters, what we were sp speaking about, it is the traits of the true believers, people with sight, people with intelligence, people who accept the Quran, what's supposed to be in their lives. And a very, very important thing, at all times we should focus on, on the, the topic that we were speaking lastly about, it is our relationship with Allah and His Rasul. What have we made of that relationship? Each Muslim, male and female, including myself and all Muslims, must ask himself, what is my relationship with Allah? Have I broken that relationship or have I still maintained that relationship? What is my relationship? What is my relationship with the greatest Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Have I broken that relationship? I have, have I stopped being a follower? Have I stopped being a follower? Or am I still a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That is our relationship. He's our guide. We are his followers. We have to check ourselves. And Allah says the sign of the true believers is that they always maintain the relations which Allah has ordered them to maintain. And those are from the greatest relations. Even it comes before relations with our family members. Our relationship with Allah and our relationship with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us on the right path and continue to guide us on the right path and make us good Muslims and true Muslims 
And we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us true intelligence and true sight so that we will see the reality of things and we will not be blinded and we will not seek honor and rank and name and we will not seek goodness from the things that really do not bring goodness. Goodness comes from Allah and that's the only place we can get it from. We have to serve Allah and worship Allah and live our lives as true Muslims. وَالْآخِرَ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Although I never saw his face so beautiful